What's up guys? We've been going through these Code Wars exercises and sometimes I like to show the short ones where you could put together a few tricks and do it all in one line. Other times we want to slow down and get a nice chunky solution with a sub function and then some setup and then you go through a loop and call that sub function as many times as you need putting together a big answer for the end. However, that's all Python of course because that's what we've been studying. I want to stress that you can really learn a lot by looking at other languages. So that's the theme for today. We want to look at some other languages and show how just those tiny differences can make you aware of things you took for granted before. So for example, I did one with Ruby, which I've always thought was beautiful. Whenever I see Ruby code, I think, oh, that looks nice. And this was a short one. Find the odd integer in a uh, in a list or an array or whatever they call it. And so we've got a for loop. Instead of the range function in Python, we have the bottom dot 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 to the end. And you can get the size by just going sequence dot size. Pretty nice. No colons, no curly brackets. The way they separate different chunks is you put end at the end of, you know, a function or an if statement or a loop or something like that. The if is pretty reasonable. This is testing odd or even. And I was a little annoyed. You can't do the fake Boolean. Like in Python, zero is false, empty list is false, empty string is false. All of these things count as false even if they're not the actual false object. And I thought I was going to be able to say that in Ruby, but it turns out that's not the case. False is actually false and nothing else counts. So you have to do not equal zero, which, you know, I, uh, that was something I missed from Python. And then one thing that's cool is that in Ruby, you don't always have to say return. It's implied if you have a statement at the end of a function or method that, hey, you want to send that value to whoever asked for it. And I might have been able to leave that off here, but I put it out of habit. And um, then I did one in Rust because that's a language I've heard a lot about and a lot of people say, that it's their favorite because it has excellent error messages. When you're missing something, it's going to tell you, hey, here's what you're missing, and here's where it should be, and did you mean this? And the reason they're able to pull that off is because it's really picky about the right types, the right memory, you're never mixing up uh, mutable aliasing or anything like that. So this one was about mapping, where you take a certain function and apply it to everything in a list and so I just googled how to do that in Rust and you go with this iter method where it iterates just like a Python for loop or something like that and then it turns out I didn't need this just like the return in Ruby I, I, I wrote more than I had to because if I was familiar with the language I would realize that this was implied and we don't have to say the type if I think it's implied because we already said it in the function definition don't quote me on that. But I know that we could leave this off if we wanted to because I saw the other solutions did that. Then I did one with JavaScript, classic, sometimes, most of the time, the number one language in the world. And this is distance between two points. I did the classic Pythagorean theorem. Not too unusual. We see that you say let if you're declaring a variable for the first time and we see that you put semicolons at the end of lines like you do in many languages. I think it might have been okay without them, but I put it because I knew that was a traditional rule. And then we say return at the end, pretty standard. I did a square root by doing a half power, which is a trick I learned from Python, but there's also a math dot sqrt that you might have to import or it might be available, not sure. Uh, one more I wanted to show, which is Swift, um, and I thought about that because I was thinking about division. Division is weird, and it's never easy. You know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, those are fine. You give them integers, and they'll give you an integer back. But I know a lot of languages don't work the way Python does with division. In Python, if you use a single slash, they're going to give you a floating point, even if you start with integers but I wanted to show one that doesn't do that. This one was saying quarter of the year, so it would give you a month like, 
you know three and you say oh that's in the first quarter of the year or they would say you know ten and you'd say that's in the last quarter of the year the way i got that was by rounding and i didn't have to say round because the regular division the default division in swift and in many languages is going to stick with the types you give it. If I give it two integers, it's going to give me back an integer, which means it's going to round down. So I wanted to try one of those just for fun. Next, I wanted to show one with C sharp. So here's a C sharp, and I already looked up during class a minute ago how to do this. So I'm not, you're not going to see me like open a tab and Google how to look at an array in C sharp or whatever, unless I forget. But the idea is we got a 2D array. In Python, we would call that a nested list. And we're going through to find the smallest one of each, the minimum, minimum, minimum. And we add those up. So we do that by a nested loop. Or at least that's what I'm going to use. There are cooler ways if you're a C-sharp expert and you know, oh, they have this way to you know, enumerate through the list. and wrap it all up in one line. I'm just going to do a baby version with one thing at a time. So we're going to start with some variables and we're going to have our size, like our, our length, which brings us to the first thing that's weird. When I was thinking of this at first, I was, my, I was confusing myself because I was thinking of the way it works in Python. When you have a nested list, the lists are like individual chunks like the rows but in this system they're more of really integrated into one thing so for example if we wanted to access something in this numbers it wouldn't be 0 and 5 as separate indices it would be 0 comma 5 you would be accessing it as like a single move to that specific spot or at least that's how it feels when I look at the syntax so the way to get the size is not what I thought I what I would do in Python is I would say like you know len of numbers to get the rows and I would say len of numbers zero to get how much in each row but you don't do it that way you do it with a different method that they call um, I'm gonna say rows equals numbers dot get length and then they have a parameter, which is like the depth. It's like how far are we going inside of it. So it's not working the same way it would in Python. But uh, let me try this. I think it's going to be what we need here. I'm going to call this calls. And then we're going to go get length 1. So like 1 doesn't mean we're looking at the first object, the first row, and then seeing how long that is. It's just the depth. It looks at it a different way. At least that's my current understanding after reading half of a page that I clicked on while Googling. So then we're going to go through the rows and columns. It does go rows and columns. That's the same as in Python or others. And we're going to do that with just two separate for loops. I'm going to go, or actually before we start I'm going to have my like result, my sum answer um, which is going to start at zero and then we're going to add to it as we go um, I'm going to say for and then the loops in C sharp are kind of like Java or several classic languages where you say start stop step but it looks very different from Python you don't say range start stop step you say create a variable what's the condition and then how does it change so we're gonna go uh, int I'm gonna say you know I'm gonna say M because they say M and N I don't know where that comes from I think that's just telling us that it's not a square that they're too different but I'm gonna use M why the heck not it starts zero and then we go um, up to the rows and then we go plus plus. That's a thing that Python doesn't have. If you want to bump something up by one, we go plus equal one. And most languages have plus equals, including C sharp. But if you want to just you want to do a single 
increment and you want it to be super fast. Um, some languages have the plus plus, which is kind of nice and quick, especially for loops like this. And then you put stuff in curly brackets. So I believe C sharp wants you to start the brackets under the line. Some languages tell you to start it on the line, even though it doesn't matter. It's a convention and you want to follow the rules just like you know capitalization or something like that. You want it to follow what people expect. Speaking of capitalization, they capitalize every word in the method, including the first one, which is unique. So we're going to have another loop inside of this one. And I'm going to call it in is the uh, same thing here. Uh, as long as I get it right. You know, I changed enough. That probably would have been faster to just start typing. And then it's got curly brackets. So that by the end, we're going to be closing a bunch of curly brackets, like the Ruby code closed a bunch of blocks with end, 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 okay? So what are we going to do? I think before each, uh, before we get into the depth of each row, we want to have like our minimum. And then we're going to look down the line. Is this one lower? Is this one lower? Is this one lower? And so we have to start it with something. I'm just going to start it with the first one. Like we'll say, okay, one, that's our lowest. And if anyone in the in the row beats that, it takes the place. Or five, that's our lowest, and if anything in the row beats that, it takes the place. So I'm going to say like min, and I have to be careful if I'm uh, overriding a built-in function or something. Like in Python, I couldn't say sum, because sum is a built-in function. I mean, I could, but it would be tricky. So let's say min equals uh, numbers uh, m comma zero, so that's the first one in whatever row we're about to traverse. And I gotta put my semicolon. And then we're gonna say, okay, if we find one that beats that, then it takes the place. So if, and then we put parentheses around the condition, um, if numbers mn is less than min. We don't have to worry if they're equal because we don't have any like index. We don't have to tell it where the minimum was. So if there's two that are tied for the minimum, we just have to say what the value is. It doesn't matter which one ends up as the, you know, the holding the championship belt. So I believe you can do a one-liner if without any curly brackets. You just say the thing. So I'm going to say min becomes numbers mn. So if, if this guy beats it, then it becomes the new minimum. And then before we go on to the next row, I'm really not comfortable with these curly brackets, so I might be putting this in the wrong spot. Um, let's see. I think that's, I don't know. Before we go on to the next row, we got to add minimum onto our sum because we're about to create a new minimum. So sum plus equals min. And then at the end, we return sum. And let's see if that works. I, well, I was about to get an error from that semicolon. I might have others. We'll see what happens. Um, OK, it's another semicolon, of course. Of course, I missed that, because that's not something I'm used to in Python. Um, line 16, so it's this one. So it's an if statement. You got to have, uh, you know, this could be like within brackets, but I'm pretty sure you can do a one liner without it. Just like in Python, you could do a one line if without indentation. You can do a one line if without the brackets, I, I believe. Okay, so now we got a different error, which is great. Uh, min does not exist in the current context. So that probably means uh, this line is in the wrong place. Uh, or no, that means this. Uh, when I try to say this statement to assign a value to min, 
it's looking for a variable that exists with that name, but there isn't one, because the first time you create it, when you declare it, you're supposed to say var. A lot of languages have something like that, var, or let, or uh, just set, stating the type. And then that's different the first time versus later I could say min equals two, whatever. But the first time you have to say, hey, this is a new thing. Give it a space in memory, that kind of uh, extra step. So again, that's something I'm not used to from Python. OK, out of range, index is outside the bounds. So that means I probably messed up on the for loop. Yes, I already see what I did, which is when I copy paste it, I didn't change everything. So M is our um, row, and N is where we're moving inside of it. And I didn't change this guy so that it was looking in the wrong spot. Um, you know, it could have uh, it could have had an infinite loop if it was never exiting. Um, and we would have got a timeout error instead. I got one of those earlier when I was doing a similar thing. So now we got it. And I want to show you guys that while this works, of course there's a faster way because people working with C Sharp for the last 20 years have figured out, okay, finding the minimum is something we do all the time. We're going to make a built-in method for that. Um, traversing multi-dimensional arrays is something we do all the time. We're going to find a way to make it more efficient. And I'm sure when we look at the solutions, there are going to be some that look way nicer or even just shorter. So um, there's a thing called enumerable that allows you to um, do a lot of these actions with pre-made methods. And sum and min and all of these things, of course they're there because this is stuff people use all the time and someone has created it. It's just like what happens in Python when I know how to do zip and enumerate and any and all and min and max and all this stuff. I can write the short versions, but if I didn't, I would have to say, okay, go through a loop, go through another loop, blah, 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 make it uh, the long way. This person did the same thing, just crammed it all into a long line. Not, not sure if that's better, but there you go. Um, this person did it like we did, which is just loop, loop, and um, the only difference is they put the get length directly in the loop instead of assigning it to rows or columns like we did. So we're looking like, ah, eh, maybe there's just two ways. You know, maybe there's just the long way like we did, and then there's the enumerable built-in method way like the professionals did. That's great, and it doesn't mean we're wrong or we're bad. It just means we did it in a way that a little extra work. Um, if you get good at a language, you'll learn all the all the tricks that make things smooth. Like um, I've seen some people who are really good with Java because they've been doing Java for a million years, and they know the old way and the way that used to be new and the way that currently is new, and um, they can just crank out whatever. And when they look at old code, they go, "Oh, I remember that." when that style was all the rage. But um, this kind of thing is the way to get there is just by practicing. So anyway, what I want you guys to do is to pick one problem from any non-Python language, even if it's an easy one, an eight or seven, and do it to see what you learn. Maybe the variables, the loops, the functions, the types work differently. Or maybe the whole thing works differently. If you choose a really wildly different language, you might realize, oh, well, they don't have loops at all, or something like that. And that would be even more fun.